Mrs. Dunboy in the Bear Peninsula, looking out towards Bear Island. It is now a peaceful beauty spot, but 400 years ago was the site of an important siege. This video is the story of the siege of Dunboy Castle towards the end of the Nine Years' War. At the end of 1601, Hugh O'Neill was defeated in the Battle of Kinsale. It was an unnecessary battle, which O'Neill was forced into fighting by Don Juan de la Quila, commander of the Spanish expedition which had landed in Kinsale at the beginning of October. Although the war would continue for another 15 months or so, the result of the battle gave England victory in the war. Nevertheless, there was still much fighting to come, including the siege of Dunboy Castle. Shortly after the battle, Don Juan de la Quila surrendered Kinsale, as well as three other ports held by Spanish and Gaelic troops. One of these was Dunboy Castle. It is near to what is now called Castletown Bear and belonged to Donal O'Sullivan Bear, also known as Donal Cam, Lord of Bear and Bantry. The latter wanted to keep fighting, in part because a senior Spanish officer, Lopez de Soto, had promised him more aid would come from Spain. O'Sullivan Bear thus recaptured his own castle using a ruse. Most of the Spanish garrison were then sent off to Baltimore, but some of the artillerymen remained. It's not known whether they had any choice in this decision, but they would fight hard and assist O'Sullivan Bear considerably. Although this may seem to have been a reckless move, O'Sullivan Bear was in a good position. He was supported by various other monster lords and the renowned Richard Tyrrell, was also reasonably well supplied with weapons and munitions, including a few pieces of Spanish artillery. His major weakness was that the English had total control of the sea. However, he expected the Spanish to return within a few months. Unfortunately for him, they did not. Despite winning at Kinsale, the English army were so weakened by the campaign that it would be several months before they were ready to march against O'Sullivan Bear. They would be led by George Carew, President of Munster. In the meantime, the garrison of Dunboy did their best to fortify the castle. Here, they were helped by the Spanish soldiers who had remained in Dunboy. Under their direction, the castle's defences were improved, including building formidable earthen embankments and taking down the top part of the castle as a precaution against shelling. The question was whether this would be enough. In May, Carew seemed ready to launch his assault on O'Sullivan Bear. He was planning to do this by sea, as he knew by land would have been extremely difficult. However, the weather delayed his plans, and he was only able to start moving his men at the end of the month. First they were sent to Bantry Bay, from where most were transported by ship to Bear Island. The battle for Dunboy Castle was beginning. It should be pointed out that O'Sullivan Bear was not in the castle. The garrison was commanded by Richard McGagan, one of Tyrrell's men. Indeed, the garrison seems to have been a mix of Tyrrell's men and O'Sullivan Bear's. The weather only improved on the 31st of May, finally allowing Carew's force to set off. Over two days at the beginning of June, his troops were transported to Bear Island. O'Sullivan Bear and his forces were aware of this. Richard Tyrrell fortified himself near what is now called Castletown Bear in order to prevent Carew from landing. On 6th of June, Carew moved again. Aware that Tyrrell's men were entrenched at the likely landing site, Carew set out to find an alternative. He was successful in this and devised an elaborate ruse to fool Tyrrell. First, two guns were set up on the small island of Dinish, which is very close to Castletown Bear and indeed now forms part of its port. Then Carew and the Earl of Tolman's regiments were landed on the island and drawn up as if they were getting ready to attack. In the meantime, the other two English regiments under Richard Percy and Charles Wilmot were ferried to the mainland to a point that was hidden from where Tyrrell was by high ground, despite being close. Eventually, Tyrrell's men discovered what was happening 
and moved to attack Percy and Wilmot. However, it was too late, as the two regiments had landed and Crew was on his way with the rest of the army. Nevertheless, Tyrrell's men attacked. They were halted by English cannon fire. Then the English pushed forward, resulting in some skirmishing, which continued until Crew's force came up. After this, Tyrrell's men fell back. Stafford claims, based on Crew's journal, that while the English force only suffered a few wounded, Tyrrell's force lost 28 killed and 30 wounded, including Tyrrell himself. This effectively doomed the garrison in Dunboy, as Carew was now between Tyrrell and the castle. He also outnumbered the Gaelic forces. Tyrrell probably had around a thousand men, while the garrison at the castle was only 140. On the other hand, Carew had 1,800 men from the Munster army, plus Irish allies such as Owen O'Sullivan, Edmund Fitzgibbon the White Knight, the Lords of Muscari and Carberry, both of whom were McCarthy's, O'Donovan, and David de Barry, Viscount Buttervent, as well as various other McCarthy's and O'Sullivan's. Carew may have had up to 3,000 men. On the other hand, the garrison received some good news shortly after the skirmish. The previous day, a Spanish ship had reached Ardea Castle on the other side of the Bear Peninsula. On board the ship were munitions, wine, various priests, including Owen MacEgan, Vicar Apostolic, letters of encouragement, and most importantly, a large sum of money, perhaps 20,000 ducats. English sources reported this as 12,000 pounds, while Stafford gives details of how it was distributed. The money, supplies and MacEgan's insistence that another Spanish fleet was being readied encouraged the Gaelic forces. A more negative impact of the arrival of the ship was that while O'Sullivan Bear was at Ardea unloading supplies and dispatching them as well as talking to MacEgan and others, Carew was besieging Dunboy. It is unlikely he would have been able to stop Dunboy from falling, nevertheless he was distracted from it at an important time. In the meantime, Carew pressed on with his siege of Dunboy. On the 7th of June, he moved his forces to within a mile of the castle. He then carried out a personal reconnaissance supported by Wilmot and a hundred foot. Contrary to the advice of the Gaelic and Old English lords in his force in Utica Castle, in a small hill around 140 yards from the castle, Carew found a natural platform on which he could place his artillery. Behind this, near the castle but out of sight because of high ground, he chose an area for his camp. The following day, he managed to land two cannons on a headland that was to the north of the castle, but separated from it by sea. These cannons began to fire on Dunboy, disrupting the work of the garrison, who were still trying to strengthen their fortifications. Over the next few days, he continued his preparations, surveying the land and sending his men out foraging. On the 10th of June, Captain Francis Slingsby managed to bring his ship and some smaller boat, carrying various types of cannons, including demi-cannon, culverins and a demi-culverin, past the castle and into the inlet beside it. Although the artillery in the castle opened fire, they achieved no hits on the English ships. However, moving the cannons into position was more difficult, due to their size and the nature of the terrain. At five in the morning on the 17th of June, the new artillery battery opened fire. The barrage went on for several hours. Around nine in the morning, a turret of the castle collapsed. The defenders had placed a cannon in this turret, which they had used to fire back at the English. Following this, the English artillery concentrated on the front of the castle. At the beginning of the afternoon, this too collapsed, opening a breach. Many of the defenders were killed in the collapse of the tower and the front wall, as they were in the fortifications built in front of the castle. After the breach was opened, the garrison sent out an envoy, offering to surrender on terms. Carew had the envoy executed. He then ordered his men to assault the breach. Despite the vast difference in numbers, the defenders fought obstinately. Nevertheless, the result was never in doubt. 
After fierce fighting, Carew's men captured part of the castle, driving back the defenders into a turret and capturing the rest of their artillery. As the fighting continued, part of the surviving garrison retreated inside the bottom of the castle, while others fought on outside. Eventually, around 40 tried to sally out, but all were killed, with the exception of eight who tried to swim away. These were all cut down by soldiers and boats. Inside the castle, the fighting continued. By the end of the day, crew held all of the castle, except the cellar, where 67 men remained. However, since the only way into the cellar was by winding stairs, defeating these men would have been costly. They offered to surrender if their lives were spared, but as might be expected, this was refused. McGagan, the commander, was mortally wounded, and was replaced by Thomas Taylor, another of Tyrrell's men. In the morning, 23 soldiers and the three remaining cannoneers surrendered. The Jesuit priest, Dominic Collins, was also captured or surrendered at this point. Thereafter followed a gruesome theatre. First of all, Taylor, standing beside nine barrels of powder, threatened to blow himself and the rest of the castle up unless they were promised their lives. In response, Carew ordered the castle to be shelled again, threatening to bury them all alive. Taylor's men prevented him from carrying out his threat, and the final 48 men surrendered unconditionally. Finally, apparently the dying Richard McGagan managed to stand up, grab a candle, and attempted to blow up the powder. A Captain Power stopped him, then other English soldiers mercilessly killed the dying McGagan. Gaelic heroics could not be rewarded. The surviving garrison was dealt with quickly. Fifty-eight were hung the same day. A few were briefly spared his fate. Dominic Collins, Taylor, Turlock Rowe, McSweeney, and twelve of Tyrrell's best men. Tyrrell made contact the following day, trying to save the lives of his men. He sent a servant of his, Lachlan O'Daly, to negotiate with Carew. However, when the latter discovered that Tyrrell wanted to ransom his men, and was refusing to betray either the King of Spain or the Catholic cause, he had the twelve executed. Collins, Taylor and McSweeney were sent to Cork, interrogated and eventually executed. Collins was the last to die, being executed on the 31st of October 1602 in Yale, where he had been born. He was regarded almost immediately as a Catholic martyr and was beatified in September 1992. In relation to English casualties, there is a strange absent here. Normally, after any battle or skirmish in the Nine Years' War, Irish casualties are usually given in the hundreds and English ones in the tens. However, this time they're not given. In a way, this is because they are irrelevant. The entire garrison had been killed or executed. However, nor are the English casualties given. Due to the savagery of the fighting, their losses were probably heavy. There are references to various sergeants and 62 soldiers maimed and wounded, and several officers being hurt and one killed, but there was no official casualty list. However, these lists were mostly either lies or misleading. Before ending the account of the siege of Dunboy, a further bloody episode has to be narrated, the massacre of Dursey Island. This island is located at the very end of the Bearer Peninsula. Carew discovered that the enemy, it is unclear whether this was the garrison of Dunboy or Sullivan Bear himself, had established a garrison there as their last and surest refuge. Stafford said that this consisted of 40 choice men, while Philip O'Sullivan Bear, the historian, says that it was a few of Cornelius O'Driscoll's men who had garrisoned a fort built by his father. They also had three pieces of Spanish artillery. Carew dispatched Captain Bostock and 160 men to the island in a pinnace and four smaller boats. Owen O'Sullivan also went with them. While the pinnace fired on the fort, the other boats landed soldiers nearby. These drove back the Gaelic soldiers from the outermost part of the fort. However, the fight in the inner fort went on for two hours before the garrison surrendered. They were then executed. Philip O'Sullivan Bear says that around 300 non-combatants, old men, women and children, were then massacred, giving gruesome details of this. While the number of civilians killed 
may not have been as high as 300, it is likely that this massacre did occur. The Elizabethan period was marked by numerous massacres in Ireland and generally horrific treatment of the Gaelic Irish, something which Elizabeth must bear the blame for. Carew's final act after capturing the castle and executing the garrison was to blow it up, to prevent it being used by the Spanish in the event of another incursion, something that would never happen. However, since it would be occupied by Cromwellian forces and made into a fort in the 1650s, this demolition must not have been too terror. Looking at the castle today, various entrenchments and fortifications can be seen, including ramparts and ravelins. Some of these were made by Cromwellian troops, others by Sullivan Bear's garrison. Well, Sullivan Bear and Tyrrell kept up the fight in Munster until the end of 1602. However, the odds against them were too great. In December 1602, O'Sullivan Bear started out in his epic trip northwards to try to continue the fight alongside O'Neill and Ulster. However, this is the subject of another video. In March 1603, O'Sullivan Bear left Ireland for Spain, where he would die in 1618. As can be seen in this video, Dunboy remains in ruins. It is one of the few battle sites of the Nine Years' War to be marked. In the 1950s, plaques were placed on the outside wall in memory of those who died or who were executed, while more recently a life-size picture of Donald Cam O'Sullivan Bear has been placed there. Today it is a peaceful, beautiful place, one that is definitely worth visiting, not only because of its beauty, but also to remember and reflect on the puzzle that is history, a puzzle with many missing and unrecoverable pieces.